is, if you look at the lower order streams, in other words, all the little tributaries that go into a stream, and you look at it in every square mile, in other words, the number of streams, these small streams per square mile, you can see that the intercoastal plain has um, more streams per mile than the outer coastal plain does. And if you think for a second, it makes sense because the intercoastal plain is made out of fine sediments, the water runs off the, over the surface. You think of the intercoastal plain, it's sandy, most of that water gets absorbed. So it would make sense that you'd have more tributaries in one than the other. If you look at their width to depth ratio, in other words, are the streams narrow and deep or are they wide and shallow? That ratio shows that intercoastal plain streams are much narrower and deeper than outer coastal plain streams. So they're gonna look very different that way. And you can also see a slight difference in stream gradient, but that's not nearly as significant here. Hey, Claude, this is Joel. I just got to chime in for a second. Sure. Um, we had a little snag, I think, with our, with our live broadcast, and I just was able to get the live broadcast back on. Uh, so I think, unfortunately, uh, we weren't broadcasting that, that beginning of your program um, just now. So should I start over again? I think if you would start over, that'd be great because we just I just got the YouTube to go. So oh, that's sorry terrific. about that. Because I can do a better job. Okay. Okay. Good morning. Uh, Landscape History of South Jersey, take three. Um, I've always been interested in the landscape of, New Jersey, of the streams in South Jersey. And part of it was just naturally they were really beautiful. But then as I would take classes and field trips, we would see that the landscape itself would be variable. And so um, I started to wonder why should a particular stream look different as you sail down it? And part of the reason was geologic and part of the reason was land use history. If you look at a typical intercoastal plain stream, these are the streams that flow into the Delaware River. You can see that at their mouths, they're just choked with vegetation. There's muddy banks that are fairly steep. The water is really turbid. Um, again, steep banks, turbid water. And finally, even at their sources, they're still muddy and their banks are still fairly steep. So this would be sort of a typical intercoastal plain stream. Be like Crosswick's Creek, uh, Black's Creek, um, Big Timber, and then a lot of them all the way down to Salem Creek. If you look at outer coastal plain streams, they look very, very different. First of all, they're blue, they're not muddy. And at some times in the summertime, they're even red because of bog iron that's dissolved in the water. So the water color is very, very different. You don't get any steepness in the banks at all. This is all very flat terrain, even here in the middle part, flat terrain in the, in the cedar bogs, flat terrain, even in their sources, large swampy areas going to the river. So this looks quite different from the intercoastal plain streams. And now I'd like to explain why that is. Okay, geological history. Once upon a time, 120 million years ago, New Jersey was part of the world continent and our position was right in the middle of it. So we weren't coastal then, we were in the interior and it would sort of be like being in Kansas or Iowa or Oklahoma. It was a very terrestrial kind of environment. Plate tectonics began to split this plate apart and the area of Africa started to split from the area of North America. So it's really funny to think that you could take a bridge back then from Jersey to Morocco, but they were right next to each other. Now, what happened was the split or the rift that formed between them started to tear this piece away from that piece. And so as time passed, you formed these rift valleys. Now this is not Jersey, this is Africa where it's happening now. And you can see all of these long skinny valleys which are forming rifts. Into these valleys, rivers will dump their sediment. So you get a lot of river sediment. If it's dry, these things will dry up and give you salt pans or salt flats. 
if it's wet, you'll end up with lakes and so you'll get lake sediment. So in the rift valleys initially, you're going to accumulate river sediment, salt pans, uh, maybe lakes. Once the rift spreads far enough apart and gets deeper and deeper into the earth, it gets flooded by the sea. And here we have the Red Sea where this has happened. The African plate and the Arabian plates are splitting and water is flowing in between them. Now, the sediment that's coming off of the plates, here's the African plate in Nigeria today. The Niger River is taking all of the sediment that's eroded from the continent and dumping it into the Niger Delta. All of the sediment from here, you can see the bulge in the sea, all of this stuff in here is what we would call coastal plain. It's the sediment that's dumped from the continent into the ocean. Now in our situation in Jersey, here's New Jersey, here's Morocco. Sediment was being dropped into the base and the rift in between them, forming these coastal plains. When sea level was low, we got river sediment, um, salt pans, maybe lake sediment, but Jersey was mainly uh, river sediment and lake sediment. As sea level rose, um, the sea invaded the rift and now we got marine sediments in there. So there's a tendency to go from terrestrial sediment, land sediment to sea sediment. And this sets the stage for a physical difference in the sediment type. Here's New Jersey, here's Southern New Jersey, and it's divided into an intercoastal plain. Those are the streams that run into the Delaware River or go across into Raritan Bay. And the outer coastal plain whose rivers empty into the ocean or Delaware Bay. Uh, this line represents a slice cut through the earth to look at the sediments that make up this pile of, of debris. And that's this here. These brown layers represent the early stages when you had river deposits of gravel and sand being dropped into the rift. As the rift gets wider and deeper, it gets invaded by the sea, and now you get uh, marine deposits. Now these marine deposits are not gravel and sand, they're mainly uh, clay, mud, a thing called green sand, a very different kind of sediment. Finally, there's so much sediment dumped into the rift that it starts to go above sea level again. And now once the uh, South Jersey area went above sea level, we start to get river sediments, maybe beach sediments, dune sediments, all sand. So what you've got is kind of like an Oreo cookie with a sandy layer on top, a sandy layer on the bottom, and a muddy layer in between. This sets the stage for a physical difference. The stuff in between, the marine sediment, is uh, made out of clay. And if you balled up clay in your hand and then put it on a desk, the ball of clay would still keep its shape. It's coherent. And that's a big difference. If you tried to do the same thing with the sands, it would probably just fall apart in your hand and go between your fingers. And so the marine sediments are coherent. They tend to resist erosion. The outer coastal plain streams tend to be made out of sand and gravel, which makes them susceptible to erosion. And that's what's gonna make a difference. Okay, here we have an example of the outer coastal plain stream, uh, Tom's River at Collier's Mills, and an intercoastal plain stream, Raccoon Creek at Mullica Hill. And aside from the difference in the seasons, what you can see is the Mullica Hill stuff has really steep banks and it's very steep near the river. It's still fairly steep once you go up to the uplands. So you get a deep valley and a sort of a, a muddy river in between. If you go to the outer coastal plain though, what you get is a very gradual change in elevation. You get basically a swamp and in the middle of the swamp, you might get this river. So here's visually the difference between the two. Now, when you canoe down a river, well, let's take it back one step. If you're canoeing and it's cold, you can feel it. 
If you're canoeing and it's warm, you can feel it. You don't need a thermometer to know that it's cold or warm. If the wind is blowing in your face or the air is stagnant, you don't need an anemometer to tell you that it's windy or stagnant. Your direct experience of nature in a way is the most profound, it's the most direct. And I would describe basically as a qualitative experience of nature. When you try and put numbers on it, and that's what a scientist tries to do is it tries to measure these differences. Then you have a slightly different story. Now you're interested in temperature, you're interested in wind speed. In the case of a river's profile, rivers are steep near their sources and they flatten out when they reach the sea. And this pattern is seen all over the world. And so what you've got is the upper parts of streams are gonna be steep. The lower parts of streams are gonna be really flat. And so this is one kind of thing you can measure. You can measure that angle and tell whether you've got a steep or a shallow stream. Another thing, these are the watersheds of Southern New Jersey, meet the folks. And what you can see is that there are big patches that make up the outer coastal plain. There's some small ones too, but look at these guys. Here's Tom's River, Rancocas, Mollica, Great Egg Harbor, Morris. The outer coastal plain streams tend to have larger uh, floodplains. The inner coastal plain streams tend to have smaller floodplains. Now this has some impact on how much water can flow through these streams. This graph shows that as the watershed area increases, the amount of water flowing through it also increases. So you've got more water flowing through the outer coastal plain than you have in the inner coastal plain. Ignore this, we don't have to deal with that. You look at this and there are a couple of things that are of interest here. Um, the lower order streams per square mile. If you have a stream that drains very well, it's going, well, if you have a stream that has a lot of small tributaries, it will drain well. If you have a stream that has very few of them, it will tend to be very swampy. And so when you look here at the numbers, the intercoastal plain numbers show that there are more small streams per square mile than there are in the outer coastal plain. Okay. So what that means is you've got better drainage in the intercoastal plain than in the outer coastal plain. The width to depth ratio. Uh, the intercoastal plain streams have a small width to depth ratio. What that means is they tend to be narrow and deep. Whereas outer coastal plain streams, a big number, means that they're wide and they're shallow. So that's another way of saying, when you go down the Molica, the river there is very, very wide and it's, you can stand up in it and not drown. If you go to the inner coastal plain, the valleys are very steep and the valleys and the rivers themselves are fairly deep. So they have a very different chemical, a very different property. Okay, here's another horror story. Too much information. All you need to know is, let's look at this one. Uh, the Raccoon Creek, Cooper Creek, Crosswicks Creek are all intercoastal plain. Um, Four Mile Branch, uh, Great Egg Harbor River, another Great Egg Harbor River, um, and Morris, is that Morris? Yeah, Morris River at these different places. What this number represents is how much mud is there in the water. You can see that in the Pine Barrens and the outer coastal plain, there isn't much. And you can see that by just looking at them. In the inner coastal plain, there's a lot of mud so that their properties are quite different. And this basically is showing the same thing in more detail. Another thing, here we have an example of a stream which is wide and relatively shallow. It has a big width to depth ratio and that's a picture of one down below. This is over at uh, Hawkins Bridge. And what you can see is the bottom of the stream looks pretty flat and pretty wide. If you go to a stream which is relatively narrow but deep, you get more of this deep V-shaped kind of terrain. So you get steep banks 
The water itself is fairly deep. And so here we have a small width to depth ratio and that will make a difference. So here's what they look like for real. Here's what the numbers show us. Now, South Jersey is subject to three kinds of flooding. The one I'm gonna focus on is river flooding. We do get water table emergence in some place, which is a real pain because it takes a long time for that stuff to drop below the surface again. We get tidal flooding, which can be pretty disastrous and we've experienced that quite a bit. But what I'm really gonna talk about is the flooding properties of the streams of the streams. Here's some data from Hurricane Irene. It um, came ashore, uh, do I have the date there? I should do. Yeah, um, it came ashore on the uh, 17th of August. In the intercoastal plain, you can see that the water level shot way up and then pretty quickly came back down again. So that what happened is we got what's called, this is a flash flood. The water rises quickly, it rises a lot, and then it settles down fairly quickly. In the outer coastal plain, what you see is the storm hit here. It didn't really start to affect the stream at all until the next day. It was a lag time. It came all the way up. And if you look at the numbers on the left, it's not as high. It's a much more modest rise. And then it took a lot longer to go back down to what it had been. So outer coastal plain streams lag behind the storm. They rise relatively modestly and they decline relatively slowly. In the intercoastal plain, it's flash flooding. Now, what this represents, let's see if I can get this out of the way. These are typical rainfalls. It's not, these are not the extreme flood events. These are just all of the floods, all of the rainfalls and the streams that they, and the streams that they made rise. In the intercoastal plain, what you've got is the stage rises are much great, are the stage rise in the intercoastal plain is much greater than the outer coastal plain. And urban streams rise at about the same rate. So these would be things like the Cooper River near Camden rises pretty high also. The durations are relatively short compared to the out, outer coastal plain. And the peak durations, how high the peak stays up, stays up much longer in the outer coastal plain than the inner coastal plain. The lag time between the stream, between the storm event and the, um, and the stream rising is about 14 hours for the intercoastal plain. Where are you? 14 hours for the intercoastal plain, 26 hours over a day for the outer coastal plain. And if you look at the flood events, the things that actually overflowed their banks, you can see that the intercoastal plain rose a lot more than the outer coastal plain. Um, the duration of the outer coastal plain was much longer than the intercoastal plain. And the peak flow, the amount of water flowing through with the inner coastal plain water had a lot more water flowing through the stream during that flood event than the outer coastal plain did. So in other words, there's a lot more water flowing over the surface of the inner coastal plain than in the outer coastal plain. Now, this is just putting it into more qualitative languages. Inner coastal plain, outer coastal plain. Stream flow is less, stream flow is more. Watershed area is smaller, watershed area is larger. Number of tributaries fewer, number of tributaries more. Drainage area is fast, drainage area is sluggish. Um, valley cross sections, narrow and deep, shallow and wide, so on and so forth. So you get a whole bunch of properties that show that streams in the inner coastal plain should look different from those in the outer coastal plain. Okay. And here we have a comparison. Upper reaches of the outer coastal plain, upper reaches of the inner coastal plain. Look at that mud. Outer middle reaches, 
of the outer coastal plain, middle reaches of the inner coastal plain. Lots of mud, vegetation, very, very steep. Outer coastal plain, this is pretty dramatic. The outer coastal plain is basically clear and open. It's got sandy, gravelly bottoms, clear water, but the inner coastal plain is choked with mud and vegetation. So they have a very different appearance. Okay, oops, here goes the neighborhood. Europeans, when they settled in New Jersey, wanted to basically reestablish what they had in Europe, in South Jersey and in North America. They were used to streams for mills, for farming. Uh, they had already established laws on what you can do with those rivers. So there was a technological heritage and there was a legal heritage that they brought with them. Now, when they came here, this is basically, this is not South Jersey. These are just miscellaneous pictures to show what a, a natural environment would have looked like before the Europeans altered it. So this is like pre-settlement. Uh, pre but in 1638, the first actual settlement in the Delaware Valley happened by the Swedes when the Kalmar nickel, the Swedish Mayflower, uh, settled at uh, what's now Wilmington on the Christina River. They've made a mock-up of the ship, which is, I think is about a quarter of the original size that's now docked in Wilmington. And you can actually take cruises on it for a couple of hours. So it might be a sort of a fun thing to do when the weather is good. <clears throat> Trying to find out what South Jersey looked like was a difficult matter. Nobody had a camera, it didn't exist then. Uh, artists weren't going out into the forests. So it was basically a forested area full of rivers and swamps, some places more dense than others. And we have several people who were responsible for describing South Jersey at that time. Let's see if I can get that out of the way. Okay, yeah. This is gonna be a pain no matter what we do. Okay, um, the first person, George Fox. George Fox was one of the founders of the Quakers. He came over to America in 1620, well, that's his age. Um, he came over to America in 1672 to look at what Quaker meeting houses had been established in New England and also in, in New England and in uh, Maryland and Virginia. And as a result, he had to cross South Jersey and at that time, there weren't any Europeans really living in South Jersey. It was all Indian territory. The Lenape were living there. And what Fox experienced was it took him a day, a day and a half to cross South Jersey. And he slept with the Indians who were very hospitable. And he was basically took it, uh, came by horse to get from one place to another. So he described what his trip was like and how difficult it was to travel across South Jersey, especially across the rivers. Now, later, we have uh, two clergymen, Nicholas Colleen and Peter Kahn. Both were Swedish Lutheran ministers and they were both uh, preachers in South Jersey. They had their churches in Raccoon, which is now uh, Swedesboro, and it pens uh, uh, one of the, somewhere in Salem County. Now, they too described what the landscape looked like. And so they had to go by horse. They were itinerant preachers. And so they would travel from um, Raccoon all the way down through Salem County and even into Atlantic County, preaching into clusters of Swedish Lutherans who were there. And they described what the trips were like, how bad the weather was, and they were going on horseback. And they also talked about how difficult it was to deal with some of the Swedish Lutherans who were living out in the outer coastal plain. Later on, we get a bunch of naturalists. John Bartram uh, wrote a lot about the swamps and the cedar bogs. Uh, John Torrey was a, uh, a botanist. Yeah, he was a botanist. And he started to describe all of the plants early on in the 18th century. Um, he describes getting lost in the pine barren sandy roads. He couldn't tell one from another. Um, John Jacques Audubon 
and Alexander Wilson, two very famous uh, ornithologists, did a lot of their paintings of shorebirds down on the Great Egg Harbor River Bay. Uh, Audubon on the Atlantic County side, Wilson on the, Cam uh, the Cape May County side. So you have these naturalists also describing it. And finally, you get Julian Niemcevich. Now, this is an interesting guy. He was the adjutant for um, Thaddeus Kosciuszko, who was the general who was in charge of the artillery during the American Revolution. After the revolution, uh, Niemcevich and Kosciuszko went back to Poland. They tried to start a revolution in the 1790s and it failed. And so they both came back to America. Niemcevich came down to South Jersey and he made a long trip describing not only the natural environment, but what things were like in the furnace areas and in the sawmills. So he was describing a lot of material. So here we have descriptions of South Jersey in the 17th and 18th and early 19th century. Now, going back to the original discovery, and this is something that always interested me. How did the Europeans know what was here? What happened was they would send, uh, the Dutch in particular, were more interested in trade than they were in settlement. So they would send their ships up the Delaware Valley and up the Delaware River and up the Hudson River. They would start to map the terrain in order to know where the best places were to trade for furs and to deal with the, uh, the local Lenape. Um, as a result, <clears throat> they started to make maps. And here we have two of the earliest ones, one from 1639 and one from 1651. One of the things you can see is there's some indication of the Morris River, there's some indication of Cohansey River. In the slightly later one, you see that they got these Delaware River valleys pretty much set. They've got most of them in there, but look at the outer coastal plain, nothing. They didn't know what was out in the outer coastal plain for a long time. Now, <clears throat> part of the, the problem is now <clears throat> we have such a, a road system throughout South Jersey that's very easy to get to almost anywhere. But back in the 17th century and the 18th century, there weren't any roads to talk of. There were some Indian paths, but basically transportation went on in the streams. And so these were the kinds of vessels that you needed to get by in South Jersey in the 17th and 18th century. A shallop was a kind of a smaller boat with sails and these could go up a lot of the creeks fairly far up. Um, a schooner, which was much larger, couldn't go quite as far. It could go up some of the rivers, but not as far as a, a shallop can. Durham boats could go up very, very far. So they could even be portaged over some of the, the difficulties and go further upstream. Finally, you get things like ferries, which could bring people from one side of the river to the other, and barges, which could bring goods from one part of the river to the other. So this was the major mode of transportation list going by, by a river. What this says is here we have a whole bunch of streams and here we have a whole bunch of um, outer coastal plain streams. What this represents is how far up those streams could a boat, could a shallop or, or a schooner go it would be called the navigable reach. So the navigable reaches of all of these rivers were anywhere from, let's see, where's a big one? Uh, you can go up 25 miles up the Great Egg Harbor River and the Mullica River. You could only go up three miles on Goshen Creek. And then you see the kinds of uh, distances you can go up. Uh, these are the kinds of ships that are known to have gone up there. And where you get the head of the navigable reach, in other words, the place where these ships could go no further, towns were established. And so you have all of these, what is this? All of these South Jersey towns establishing where you get to the top of the navigable reaches. Now, these were very good places commercially because you could get all of the interior raw materials from further inland brought down to these towns and then have these shallops and barges and all these other uh, sea, uh, river vehicles take those goods to market. You could also bring all the finished goods from market 
back to these towns to sell to the local people. So that's why a lot of these towns got established at the head of the navigable reach. Now, the other option you had was to go by foot. And so what you had basically is easiest thing would be to go on foot. Next easiest thing would be to go on horseback. Later on, you start to get carriages and wagons. And in order to get carriages and wagons, you need to have road quality that's better than what you can do on foot or on horse. So you had to have roads established for these particular things. And they started to develop. The first uh, colonial road was built or started in about 1704 between Burlington and Salem. Now, the roads were basically before that, these Indian paths. So in the 17th century, we knew that there were various kinds of paths that went through all around New Jersey. And just like today, it's not easy to go from the Southwest to the Northeast in New Jersey. There aren't any really good roads that do that. You have roads that will go from West to East and you'll have even one road that'll go from North to South and then a lot of coastal roads. So the original Indian paths didn't allow for a lot of easy travel to big blocks of South Jersey. Now, well, this represents, uh, this is a pain, uh, the first towns that got established. So it's interesting, South Jersey didn't settle as early as New York or Pennsylvania. It took a while. And so the first Europeans to get into South Jersey were late. They came in the 1660s. And these are basically Swedes, Finns, and a few Dutch coming from Pennsylvania, moving into South Jersey, buying land from the Indians. And as time passed, what you could see is more and more towns were established. Uh, we get to see Salem established around this time in 1774, 70, oh, here it is, 76. We start to get the other towns happening when the Quakers start to come in 1777. And so we start to get <clears throat> more European settlement only after the Quakers come and settle Burlington and Salem. <clears throat> this is basically an intelligible, unintelligible example. It just shows you that the purchase from the Indians went from near the mouth of the streams. Later, they bought the lower reaches. The uh, Europeans bought the lower reaches from the Indians. And finally, <clears throat> they got the upper reaches from the Indians later on. So the Europeans are moving upstream as time passes. The Lenape are moving away as this happens. Now, <clears throat> the Europeans brought with them their technical heritage. <clears throat> and so what you see is here's a picture of Holland. Uh, you can see there are bulkheads down here. Uh, there are docks. Uh, you can even see a windmill, uh, some ships. So this is not a natural stream bank. This is a human, a man-made stream bank. Lower reaches changes. Uh, here is bulkheads at, um, what is this, Bridgeton? I think it's Bridgeton. And what you can see is the Europeans constructed bulkheads. They had quays where the boats could dock. They had ramps where they could put in new ships. They had graded the topography and took away all of the vegetation so that uh, items uh, can be taken and easily taken off ships or put onto ships. They had warehouses where this stuff can be stored. They had taverns where sailors and visitors could stay and have dinner. So what you've got here is a lower reach town that replaced a natural lower reach area like this one up here. Here's Tom's River. You now have uh, docks in here, all of the facilities that you would need for a waterfront, but it's not like the natural environment that was there ahead of time. Here are some inexpensive housing that's along the Delaware River at Penn's Grove, 
And you can see, again, this is not a natural environment. This is a man-made environment with lots of changes. This is just to show you that almost every stream in South Jersey had some kind of landing and landing facilities um, on them. So here we have all of the streams and all of these landing areas and the kinds of changes that would occur. Now, here's another thing. <clears throat> when the Dutch came to the Delaware Valley, it was like old home week for them because the area was very similar to the kind of land they were living in in Holland, in, in the Netherlands. And what they did there was they would close in a part of the bays with a dike and then fill in the area inside the dike and turn it into agricultural land. And so over the periods, over the centuries, uh, Holland built up more land area out of the bays by building what they called polders. And we would just think of these as uh, dikes and agricultural land. Um, another place where this happened was the Fenland in England, which was also a wetland that got enclosed by dikes and filled in. The man who did most of that work was this guy Cornelius Vermoden. Vermuden, uh, there we go. Uh, he was the chief civil engineer for building these polders in Holland. Um, he was brought over by James I in the early 1600s to take a look at what he could do with the English countryside. Charles I set him to work on the Fenland. Charles II knighted him, so he became Sir Cornelius Vermuden, and he was responsible for building or for reclaiming, as they would say, all of the wetlands in the Fenland area of England. Now, when the Dutch came to South Jersey, they did the same thing. They put it up a dike all around this land, filled it with soil and farmed it. And this is the last of those particular uh, filled in dams, sort of a South Jersey polder at Boucham Farm. So the lower reaches were being converted to farmland. Okay, I gotta move you again. Um, and what this tells you is, this is a, a, a DEP summary of the dike works that were, or the levees that were built around the rivers in South Jersey. So a lot of the rivers got modified in their lower reaches to become farmland or other things. Um, now, other things that happened is when you started taking ships and bringing them into the harbors of these rivers, you had to alter the rivers to accommodate them. So one of the things you had to do was deepen the channels, steepen up the banks, cut around the meanders so the channels could be straight. Because if you had a barge, you didn't want a barge to go around a meander, around a bend in the stream. You wanted it to go straight through. And so there were a lot of streams that got modified to allow barge traffic to go up, up and down them. And what you see again here is that that happened all over South Jersey. Um, now this shows you the current land use. Lower reaches today have two kinds of uses. In the Delaware River, they're largely used for those kinds of land uses that you don't really wanna live around. So aside from having all of these ports and docks and uh, places for ships to disembark stuff, you start to have other things like um, sewage treatment plants, chemical, uh, chemical plants, uh, quarries, all the sorts of things that will be kind of icky to live around. And what you see here, let me get you a little higher, is that on all of these intercoastal Delaware River streams, you see a lot of um, uh, con docks constructed, whoops, where did you go? Docks, you see a lot of warehouses, and you start to see some pleasure crafts, some marinas forming, because there are some places where you can do that. But if you go to the outer coastal plain to the coast and to Raritan Bay, what you see is the predominant use of the lower reaches is for pleasure craft. 
So there are some places where you get some stuff that would be dumped or left in the, in the wetlands. But basically along the lower reaches, you're looking at pleasure craft. And here we have some pictures of it. Here's pleasure, this is on the lower reaches of the intercoastal plain. And what you get is some, in this industry, along the lower reaches of Mantua Creek, freighters actually docking on Mantua Creek. Um, here we have a dike with a floodgate built on the mouth of um, Rapopo Creek. And here we have some nice marinas right at Crosswicks Creek. All the kinds of activities that occur on the lower reaches of the intercoastal plain. Even more, you see atomic power plants. Nobody wants to live near one, so they put it out on the salt marsh. And here we have the nuclear power plant at Salem, or near Salem. All the docking facilities near Camden, the uh, tank farms in South Jersey. And here we have Mystic Islands. Now you look around and you can see here's natural environment. There's nice, probably forests in here, forests in here. Here we have salt marsh. And you can see to some extent in the salt marsh, there are ditches carved. And this was for mosquito control. So the, so the salt marshes themselves are being altered for mosquito control to lower the water levels. And then people started to build houses out here. And I don't think they can do this anymore, but you start to see major housing developments along the coast. Now, the middle reaches <clears throat> had a different kind of history. The middle reaches had enough flow to turn water wheels. And as a result, they became a great place for mills. You could mill anything that you needed to grind, hammer, pound, press, um, saw, any kind of thing that needed power, you could build a mill for. And the mill's power source was the river. Jersey had an advantage because the rivers in South Jersey would tend to flow all year round. If you go over to Eastern Pennsylvania, what happens there <clears throat> is many of their streams just dry up or flow at much lower levels that will not allow a mill to operate. So the mills in Pennsylvania were far more seasonal than the ones in New Jersey. And have we have, here we have a mill at uh, oh, Walmford. And what you needed to do here is alter the natural environment by putting in a dam, building a reservoir, building a mill, and then having some kind of a mill race, which would take water out of the reservoir, bring it through the mill, and then pass it down, down below the dam. So that's what the kind of alteration that would go in the middle reaches. Reservoirs, dams, mill races, mills. And here we have some examples of some. Uh, these are in South Jersey. These are in the outer coastal plain. This is Weymouth Furnace. It was a, an iron furnace at one point then became a paper mill. And here are some of the remaining uh, structures of Weymouth Furnace. Uh, here we have some old, uh, probably this was part of a, a building uh, here we have some uh, building materials, building materials. Here we have Pleasant Mills Paper Factory. Again, to make paper, you have to crush the, uh, the grasses to form the uh, paper. And so you needed the power of the mill to uh, run that particular furnace, uh, to run that particular factory. Now, here are some other structures that occur in the middle reaches. Here's a dam at Presidential Lakes, and here's the outflow. Uh, so here we have, basically this is a, a real estate lake. It's a lake for the buildings that are around it. Here we have a, a canal, which is in Mount Holly. And you can see that there's a whole district where water is being brought out of the Rancocas Creek and passed through these canals to various factories and buildings within the town. Here we have a mill race, which brings mill water, which turns a water wheel, which comes out of here. The water wheel comes in here and the water is flowing through this mill race, turns the water wheel and powers the factory that was there. You can see it today at Walmford. Here we have a straightened channel just below Martha Furnace. 
And what happens is you can trace the original channel around in the woods, and you can see how straight the channels are and how steep those banks are because they've been excavated for industrial purposes. So this is what an, a con an altered middle reach looks like in much of the Pine Barrens. Here's an aerial photograph, again, of Martha Furness. And what you can see is these are the original meanders. So the stream had a much more wiggly course. And Martha Furness was up in here. They needed to bring uh, bog iron to the furnace. And so these curves would be very difficult for the barges to, to manage. Once they made pig iron at the furnace, they'd have to transport that stuff down to the river. And again, you had to cut through these, these, cut, these meanders to make a straighter channel for uh, the uh, barges to pass through. Now this I love. <clears throat> there were places where they excavated the bog iron along the channels. And the way they did this is they would go up the river and find a place where the bog iron was seeping out at the surface. They would then build a, uh, basically a wall of wood to carve out a square area. And then they would drain the water out of that square area and scrape out the bog iron and put it either in a barge or in a wagon. So what you have here is an old excavation site for bog iron. And the way you can tell that is you can still see some bog iron forming there, but it's the sharpness of these bends that tells me that this is where they excavated the stuff. Okay, this just tells you the number of mills that there were, the total number of mills in all of these streams. There wasn't a stream in South Jersey that didn't have a mill on it. And these represent only the ones that had more than nine mills on them. So that means there were a lot of them that had fewer than nine mills on them. And what you can see is most of them were grist mills and sawmills. Now this tells you mill construction um, through time. So if you start off in the 17th century, you see that there are a couple of mills forming, but by the 18th century, around the time of the revolution, they really bulk up. So you're starting to get a lot of mills forming. And then finally, by the middle of the 19th century, you can see that there are very few of them being built. So there's kind of a periodicity with all of these water powered mills, most of them occurring around here. Iron works, iron furnaces were another things that needed water power. The bellows that powered the furnaces had to be run by water power. And what you can see here is the various iron works that existed, um, the rivers or the watersheds that they were on, and when they were built. And so you can see that the first one was at, this is actually, um, what is that called? It's on Shrewsbury Creek. Oh, Tinton Furnace was in the 17th century. It was sort of like an outlier. It started to happen more in the 18th century and really bulked up at the end of the 18th century into the beginning of the 19th century. And then you start to get fewer and fewer of them. And the last one is in 1832. So that the mills just, and the furnaces, both of those things kind of ended in the middle of the 19th century. Okay. Upper reaches. Basically the upper reaches were used largely for agriculture. In the outer coastal plain, it was used for cranberry agriculture. And what you have here is what they would do to the area. They would clear out all of the vegetation and all of the topsoil, and they would get down to the peat layer. They would then dump lots and lots of sand on top of the peat and plant the cranberry plants in the sand. So you could see that what was once a cedar bog has now become a cranberry bog. And during harvest time, it's a beautiful time to go out in the Pine Barrens to see the harvesting of the cranberries near, near Chatsworth. And here we see them with all of them floating up at the surface. This is White's Bog, where what you can see here is there are a lot of different cells of each one of these things grows cranberries. The dark ones are reservoirs. 
and they need the reservoirs to flood the bogs. They flood the bogs to make the berries, which are buoyant, come to the surface so they can harvest them. Then they also need them flooded during the winter so the plants don't freeze. And then they come back, uh, they, they take the, drain the water out in the springtime to allow the plants to grow in the sunshine and then flood them again during the harvest season. So it's a constant flooding from these reservoirs into the bogs and then draining it into the river when they don't need it anymore. Now this shows you the acreage of cranberry bogs. When people started to realize cranberry bogs could make them some money, they really started to put in the acreage by, what is that, 1920, massive amounts of acreage. What they found is as time passed, they could get better productivity from fewer acres. And so recently the amount of acreage is much smaller. The amount of cells or the amount of bogs in each, uh, in each drainage basin, in each watershed is depicted here. And you can see that these are mostly, uh, they're all in the outer coastal plain and some have a lot more than others. Oh, here's one from the inner coastal plain, but that's the outer coastal plain part of it. So we have mainly uh, outer coastal plain streams with their uh, cranberry bogs. Um, it alters the environment because you start to see channels, ditches dug into the bogs. Um, you could start to see reservoirs put there to flood the bogs. And then in the inner coastal plain, it's slightly different. The streams, the upper reaches of the streams are the place where they dump stream storm, uh, storm water runoff. So the runoff from the developments, from the shopping centers and from the roads are put into an underground pipe and pumped and uh, drained into the underground stream. So it's really a stormwater runoff system. In other parts, you see agriculture growing right up to the edges of the streams. And so here, you see they're affected a large degree by agriculture. Now, the streams were obstructed to some degree by some kind of uh, something other, and it didn't matter what reach you were in. If there was a road, if there was a highway, if there was electric lines, there are lots of things that cross the floodplains that interfere with the flow. And what you can see is that all of these watersheds, all of these streams have some kind of interference because of road work. So in a sense, there are no wild streams in New Jersey. Now there are two that are designated as wild streams by the federal government, but that's only small reaches that have been mildly impacted. Most of them have been majorly impacted. And you can see that that's what's happening here is that all of these streams have some kind of an obstruction. Okay, we're missing up this, let's put you down here. Um, the Europeans brought with them also a whole series of laws. And if you look at the first water laws, they go back to the laws of Hammurabi. So we're talking about riparian law, river law, which was set up by the people in Mesopotamia and Egypt in ancient times. So people realized that if you, the difference between let's say real estate and rivers is real estate stays put. You can carve it up and sell it to people. But rivers are constantly moving. The water flows from one property to another property. And so if you do something upstream, it's gonna affect somebody downstream. This was recognized very, very early. And so laws started to develop on what you could and could not do in, uh, to a stream. This became very clear in Roman time when people were given by the government clearance to fish or to travel up and down a river without interference by the landowners of the land on either side of it. They couldn't interfere with transport. They couldn't interfere with uh, fishing. They also had to allow access to people to come and get to the streams. They had to allow access to people to repair them. So what happens is streams start to get a whole series of laws that are somewhat different than the real estate, regular real estate. Now, what happened in colonial times and early state times is if you did anything to a stream, 
you had to get permission from the state. There were regulations that you had to follow. There were permits that you had to get. And you needed permits for structures. If you made a port, a ferry, a bridge, a bank, a dam, all of these things, you needed to get permission from the colony, the colonial government, or the early New Jersey state government to build any of these structures. If you took any of these actions, you needed to get permission as well. So um, if you were erecting a structure, improving a structure, maintaining a structure, repairing a structure, you had to get a permit. If you were preserving the fisheries, if you were ensuring the freedom to fish, if you were supporting migrations of fishes, whales, oysters, and clams, you needed the permission of the state. Drainage, if you were draining a meadowland, this was a big deal, um, you needed permission of the state or the colony. Prevent tidal flooding, you needed permission. All of these kinds of things were involved with permitting. Uh, first metal laws. It doesn't really, you don't have to really read all of this stuff at best you can't read it. But what you can see is that the first river laws were established in the 17th century. And this was on the Delaware River. So you see a whole host of laws uh, regulating the meadows, draining them to prevent them from flooding, to turn them into agricultural fields. You needed a permit. And this started very, very early. Fisheries. Um, to um, establish or to, do, to work in fisheries, you had to get the permit. And again, the earliest permits are 17th century in the Delaware River. And what they were looking for here is what fishes you could fish, which ones you couldn't, what kinds of techniques could you use to catch them. And you see here all kinds of regulations that were established throughout South Jersey streams. No, that doesn't work. Okay. Um, bridges and dams, the same thing. It got starting in the early or the middle uh, 18th century, um, bridges all the way down to the late 18th century. As far as dams are concerned, 17th century all the way to the 18th century. Construction of docks, it's the same thing. All of these things required certificates. Now, it wasn't just a matter of manipulating the landscape. You had also people who were, you had to get permission to take water out of the streams or dump water into the streams. And so the actual stream flow itself required regulation. And people withdrew water or got permits for various irrigation practices, agriculture, horticulture, aquaculture, general irrigation, golf course irrigation, industrial uses, or water supply. These were permitted activities to take water out of the streams and reduce their flow. Um, discharges uh, for discharging uh, treatment plants, domestic sewerage, uh, regional outfall plants, industrial and commercial outfall plants, these things which are different kinds of uh, commercial outfalls. Uh, general permits for fuel cleanups, all of these kinds of activities would add water to the streams and probably also add chemical components to the streams which would interfere with their original natural quality. So people were manipulating the stream flows. This just shows you how many uh, permits were issued in 2005 for withdrawal of water. And you can see that a lot of withdrawals occurred on the intercoastal plain, not so much on the outer coastal plain. Discharge permits. You could see that there are a lot of discharge permits into intercoastal plain streams, fewer in outer coastal plain streams, but they're still there. Look at this, the Morris River has 50 permits in 2005 for dumping stuff into the river. Now, it could have been worse. Uh, streams in New Jersey are not known for having major rat problems. There may be some locally, but it's not a big deal. Uh, none of the streams in New Jersey are totally cemented in, like this is the Los Angeles River. There's nothing like that. 
uh, in Philadelphia and some places where they have um, buried the streams uh, to grading the surface, the streams find their way back into their old channels and they potholes. So you see some major potholes in Pennsylvania. You don't see much of this in South Jersey. Massive dumping of trash into the rivers. You don't see much of that either. So that a lot of these really horrendous kinds of activities are not occurring in South Jersey, which is to say that the rivers in South Jersey are not bad. They've got some problems, but they're not bad. It could have been worse. Now the question arises, how come the rivers in South Jersey are so good? Now, again, I'm not saying that they're not polluted in places and that, but generally speaking, they're not terrible. And the reason for that is first of all, railroads and highways replaced river travel. In other words, the road systems became so good that you didn't have to rely on boats. You could take a, a cart, a wagon, and ultimately trucks and cars onto the roads and do the things that you used to do that you'd have to do by the rivers. Now, boilers, generators, and motors replaced uh, water power. So you didn't need the streams to generate your machinery anymore. You could have other kinds of power sources to turn your machinery. And as a result, the mills and the factories could move closer to their markets. They weren't restricted to being along a river. And so you start to see cities starting to develop lots of factories making the kinds of things that used to be made by stream power. Cars and trucks and motorized farm machinery uh, replaced horses. Okay, this is something we don't really have to deal with very much anymore. Cars and trucks, you have to fill up with gasoline. Horses and oxen, you have to fill up with grass. And so you have to make provisions for feeding the farm animals. This involved making lots and lots of hay. And so making forage for your forest animals became very, very important. And so a lot of that was occurring on the lower reaches of streams. And there's some kind of interesting American revolutionary events that happened because of that phenomenon of uh, horse forage. You didn't need that. And so as a result, you didn't have to change the uh, lower reaches of streams to produce grass anymore. Uh, grain production shifted to the West. Uh, out in the Midwest, um, people could grant, have acres and acres of granaries and farms. And so the amount of grain that used to be produced in the middle Atlantic states and in New England was reduced a great deal. And so once again, you didn't have to alter uh, lower reaches or other areas to produce grains. And what's more, people went where the work was. And so the factory workers and the farm workers would move to where the mills moved. As a result, the use of the rivers in South Jersey, especially the middle reaches and in the outer coastal plain, dropped off dramatically. And as a result, they'd been left, the rivers were left alone to uh, basically heal as much as they could. And that's why when we take a canoe trip or a kayak trip down these rivers, we can enjoy something that was close to the original natural condition with some signs of land use of the past. Thank you very much. Wow, Claude, that was a really fantastic look at the geology and you know how it all come together and really led to how the Pine Barrens in South Jersey were used. And that really explained a lot. And it was really great to see, you know, all those different things come together in one presentation. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. It's my pleasure. Also, thanks for uh, some of the technical difficulties we had. Thanks for putting up with that. And uh, <laughs> You know, really, really neat to see all those connections and just how one thing leads to the other. And uh, it really explained a lot if you, you spend time in South Jersey and been around a lot of those places that you showed in those streams and rivers. Uh, it really all came together very well. No, oh, thank you. The history of South Jersey is really very interesting when you get down to the nuts and bolts, how people actually use the environment. I find that a lot very, very interesting.
Uh, if any folks have questions out there, the number's up on the screen. Feel free to call in and uh, we'll take your question live on the air. I know there's a, a number of people, 20 or so, that are watching live now. So please feel free to give us a call. <laughs> you know, I really like looking at those old maps. I've looked at those old maps a lot myself, and you really see where uh, the intercoastal plain along the Delaware had that much greater uh, development. And they're listing the, like the other coast, the coast, the outer coastal plain is like sandy desert areas. And it wasn't for a long time. So like, just like you showed that, you know, the east coast of New Jersey start to fill in uh, with, with, with that coastal trade and some of those other things taking place right on the shore. Oh, yeah. I remember having, uh, I used to take the high speed line from uh, Lindenwald into Philadelphia. And you can start to see the beginning of the intercoastal plain there because there's a, uh, a gully right next to the tracks and it shows some of the green sand and mud that made up the intercoastal plain sediments. If you drive a little bit further over to the east, you're into the sand and it's entirely different. Yeah. So it's kind of neat. At the, you know, you start looking, you notice these, these things. The, when you see a sandy soil, you know you're in the outer coastal plain. Yeah, I really appreciated that blend of the geology, the history and the culture, uh, you know, and, and it's just neat to look at things in those perspectives. Okay, yeah. And that had to take a lot of time, especially the quantitative part of that, adding, you know, getting all those calculations, getting all the numbers of the mills and the, the that, so that was a lot of work to, to put that presentation together. Yeah, well, I couldn't really do that until I retired. And once I retired, um, I started looking into this. So it took me about five years to collect all of this stuff. It's coming out in a book uh, probably by the end of this year on uh, the history. It's, I call it a uh, environmental biography of the rivers of, of New Jersey, of South Jersey. Yep. <clears throat> so if you're interested in the book, um, get in touch with, um, who would it be? I guess Tom Kinsella at Stockton. Uh, that's being published by the South Jersey Historical and Cultural Center. Um, I'm sure if you called up Tom Kinsella, uh, he would help you with that. Yep. Excellent. That's, uh, that's good to know, and that's uh, something to look forward to as well. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. I uh, am fortunate to work with our science office and do a lot of our water level monitoring. So uh, mm -hmm. when you were talking about the different styles of streams, you know, the, the intercoastal plain with those deep, narrow ones and the outer coastal plain with the um, you know, wide, shallow ones, I'm always looking at those hydrographs, the USGS hydrographs, because that determines when we do a lot of our work, depending on the flow of the streams, if it's been impacted by a recent storm. So that was a, you know, pretty neat to, to see uh, another way that, 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 especially with the flooding, how they go up steep and the others go to slower. I mean, I see that all the time, you know, pretty much every time it rains. Yeah, I remember the last four years at Stockton, I would download all of the continuous flow data from 24 gauging stations in South Jersey. So I have a huge book with all of these hydrographs in them. And what I did was I basically uh, condensed it by coming up with some measurements and making some hydrographs. And uh, it's it's what you'd expect. It's, it's kind of like, um, once you look into it, it's a matter of, oh, is that what it is? It's, a, it's, we behave in a very reasonable, simple way in terms of the hydrographs and our, our water resources. All right, well, I wanna thank you again. I really enjoyed the presentation. Uh, I guess we're not gonna have any callers today, but that's okay. If, I, have uh, my, I have my email address there in case they wanna email me stuff. Yep. Perfect. So uh, like Claude said, there's his email address. If you do have questions, you want to follow up uh, with some of the technical aspects uh, of this pre uh, presentation, uh, feel free to email Claude. And uh, Claude, I want to thank you again. Uh, I really enjoyed your presentation. My pleasure, Joel. Thank you. All right. Uh, next week, we're going to change uh, direction a little bit. We've got a program called Tunes and Tales and uh, New Jersey's Troubadour. Uh, Valerie Vaughn is going to uh, 
play some of her music, which are all based on oh. stories and folk tales of Southern New Jersey. So that'll be next week's program. Uh, next Thursday at 11 o'clock, we'll be showing uh, Tunes and Tales live with Valerie Vaughn. So see you all out there. And on that note, I'm going to stop the library.